Our God is awesome, isn't he? And I don't know about you, but I thought the kids from our summer day camp were awesome today, too. I, I just appreciated, appreciated their ministry. Now, pray for us. They have to do that four times tomorrow. And if you're a parent of one of those children, leave now and get them to bed, okay? <clears throat> well, Pastor John mentioned that next week, Pastor Rock will launch us into a special four-week series to help us gain a biblical perspective on the matter of homosexuality. But today we return to our study in the book of Ephesians. Remember that as was his practice, Paul would use the opening chapters of this letter to lay a foundation of understanding of the faith. He wanted the church to grasp the scope and grandeur of God's gracious plan of salvation. And then in the chapters that follow, chapters 4, 5, and the first part of chapter 6, the apostle turned to the very practical. How does this faith work out in everyday life, in our personal character and discipline, in the church, in our home, in our marriages, in the workplace? Having said all this, in chapter 6, verse 10, where we start our reading today, Paul begins with the word, finally. Now, usually this word signals two things. First, it indicates a conclusion. In this verse, Paul's going to begin to wrap up his letter to the Ephesians. But the word finally also signals this. It says, I just have one last important point to make. Don't miss this. With that in mind, let's look together at our text in Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10. Finally... Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places." Well, last week, Pastor Rock encouraged us in the practice of seeing with new eyes in our everyday life in the workplace. In our text today, Paul continues to challenge us to see with new eyes, but in an entirely different context. And so I've entitled today's message, Seeing the Unseen. Seeing the Unseen. Let's bow our heads and pray, shall we? <clears throat> Father, tonight I pray that you would use my humble words to help plant the seeds of your eternal word in the hearts of your people. In these moments, as we willingly place ourselves under the authority of your word, would you change us? And you, would you strengthen us for the spiritual battles that lie ahead? In Jesus' name, amen. And as we prepare our hearts... To hear his eye-opening word, may the Lord be with you. Well, it held all the promise of a beautiful fall day. Perfect temperature, bright sun, cloudless, clear blue sky. I was working in my office over on East Ohio Street, which afforded me at least a partial view of the city skyline. My radio was on in the background with just about 9 a.m. and news alert interrupted the normal programming. A tragic incident had occurred in New York City. Reports said a plane had struck one of the World Trade Center towers. Now it was thought to be a small private plane, but that was still unclear. What a terrible accident, I thought, as I offered a prayer for those involved and quickly settled back into my work. And then just minutes later, another news alert broke my routine. Another plane, apparently a commercial airliner, had struck the second tower. This couldn't be an accident. It had to be a coordinated attack, the news anchor speculated. Shaking my head in disbelief, I directed my full attention to the radio, as even as I looked out the window at our own USX tower. Scanning the sky for airplanes, I, I wondered, could the USX Tower be next? 
like me, many of you remember exactly where you were on that morning, September 11th, 2001. It was all so confusing. It was almost surreal, wasn't it? Without advance notice, a new and stark reality suddenly dawned upon all of us. We were at war with an unseen enemy using terrible and deceitful new strategies bent on our destruction. On 9-11, an unsuspecting America woke up to find itself at war. In our text today, the apostle wants to ensure that the church is not caught unsuspecting. In effect, Paul is saying, wake up to this reality, church. As followers of Jesus, you're in a war against a powerful but unseen enemy. Using deceitful strategies who's bent on your destruction. Unfortunately, some of us begin our walk with Jesus in the mistaken notion that compared to my old trouble-plagued life, following Jesus will be like a walk in the park. But Paul wants us to know the Christian life is no walk in the park. For the pathway of following Jesus leads not past the park playground, but right into a spiritual battleground. So today, church, we want to put on our night vision goggles, as it were, the ones that that open our eyes to the spiritual battlefield and illuminate the reality of an eerie but determined enemy that lurks in the darkness. Tonight, we want to ask God to help us see into the unseen. And as we do so, we'll recognize that first, our our natural senses, sight and hearing, they're of little use to us here because Paul tells us this confrontation with the spiritual forces of evil takes place in the heavenly places. What are these heavenly places? Is the Bible talking about a Star Wars galaxy far, far away? Or are the heavenly places somewhere closer at hand? Well, five times in the letter to the Ephesians, Paul used this term, the heavenly places. And I've included all of those references in your notes. Maybe in your growth groups, you'll want to look those up and discuss them together. But basically, Paul uses the term, the heavenly places, to describe the sphere of spiritual activity that surrounds us an unseen world that coexists with and is even more real than our tangible world. The spiritual more real than the tangible? Really? I mean, for most of us, the spiritual realm seems a little fuzzy out there, doesn't it? Certainly much more fuzzy than the world of the wood I can knock on or the person I can talk with, or the piano I can play. Well, the unseen world is more real than the seen because from the spiritual world comes the power and direction to move people and events in our physical world. Now, philosophers use terms like cause and effect. The Bible teaches that much of what happens in our physical world, the effect has activity in the spiritual world as its root cause. For example, God, who is spirit, spoke in the spiritual and all of creation came into being. Even Jesus admitted, I can do nothing of my own accord, but only what I see the Father doing. In essence, Jesus was saying, I can only affect on earth what I first see my father doing in the spiritual realm. And so a biblical worldview as opposed to a modern Western worldview, a biblical worldview understands that as human beings, we live simultaneously in two worlds, the human and the divine, the temporal and the eternal, the earthly and the heavenly, the seen and the unseen. Now, most of us probably nod our heads in agreement with that. 
But for all practical purposes, we live our lives as seeners. No disrespect to the truthers or the birthers, but seeners... Seeners are Christians who, practically speaking, live as if the world that can be seen is the only one that really matters, at least this side of the grave. Are you a seener? Let me illustrate, by way of a personal example, the relative significance of these two worlds, the seen and the unseen. My wife Lynn and I would agree that our kids are two of the greatest gifts we could ever imagine. But truth be told, neither one of them was planned. In fact, when Lynn learned she was pregnant with our first son, Derek, who's now 23, she worried for days about how to tell me and how I would react. You see, Blaine, the planner, was convinced that we weren't ready for kids yet. In fact, the very week before Lynn's pregnancy test came back pink, we had come here to the church to talk to one of the pastors about our differences on this very issue. But so worried was my wife about telling me that she was pregnant that she dreamed up a special plan. Having written a letter from our unborn child to me, Lynn took me out to dinner and then asked me an, to open a letter that had just come for me. Dear Dad, it began. <laughs> I can't wait to meet you. <laughs> and after recovering from my shock, my heart just melted. Now, the next Sunday, we came back and told the pastor who had counseled with us that we were expecting a baby. He just looked at us, pumped his fist, and said, man, I'm good. <laughs> to this day, I'm not sure what he meant by that. <laughs> but listen, here's the point. In the seen world, Derek was just another unplanned pregnancy, an accident. But in the unseen world, the Bible tells us that there was a very different reality. Psalm 139, 16, if I personalize it, it reads like this. God, your eyes saw Derek's unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for Derek, when as yet there were none of them. In the physical seen world, Lynn and I were like, oops, we weren't ready for this. But in the unseen world, God already knew Derek. He already knew his whole life story. God knew Derek would be a preemie born on Mother's Day, 1989. He knew that at age four, Derek would think he was Batman. He knew that he would love to run track, would become a kindergarten teacher, move to North Carolina. Before Derek was even a twinkle in my eye, God knew he would one day give his heart to Jesus. So church, which is the more real of the two worlds, the more significant? Our tangible world of oops or the spiritual world of God's unfolding plan for Derek that was already seen in the heavenly places. And so today, God asks us to see into the unseen into the heavenly places, the spiritual realm. And when we do, we'll find that we face there a determined and powerful enemy. The apostle refers to him as the devil, which means accuser. Elsewhere in scripture, he's also called Satan, which means adversary. Were we to survey the scriptures, we would find that the devil's a personal being, not merely an impersonal influence, or the dark side of the force. At one time, he was among the greatest of angels, leading the hosts of heaven and worshiping our triune God. Now, how evil originated and entered into his heart, we don't know. Only that it did. And that Satan, together with a large number of angels, rebelled against God's authority and was swept from the presence of God and cast down to the earth. Therefore, the Bible calls him the God of this world, 
For in truth, he and his demonic legions of fallen angels do exercise authority here. But it's the authority of the tyrant or dictator who having, having suffered the key strategic defeat continues to fight on even though his doom is assured. In addition to accuser and adversary, the devil was also called tempter, murderer, liar, thief, dragon, and serpent. Jesus refers to him as the enemy, and indeed he is. For Peter reminds us, he prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone, someone like you or like me, to devour. My father-in-law has long had a ministry among people who are under a satanic or demonic attack. Now recall that Jesus met such a man afflicted by a legion of demons and, and he cast those demons out into a herd of pigs. And you remember that? They ran off the cliff. Knowing this, dad has his own name for our spiritual adversary. He calls him Old Hognose. He says Old Hognose really overplayed his hand on this one. But know this, Old Hognose is the enemy of your souls. Though he tries to appear godlike, we must always remember to use a small g in reference to him. For Satan bears the limitations of a created being, unlike our eternal, all powerful, all knowing, everywhere present, creator, capital G, God. Because he's not divine, not all-knowing, and can't be everywhere present, Satan projects his power through an organized army of lesser demonic beings who carry out his wishes. These are the fallen, the fallen angels, the rulers, the authorities, the cosmic forces, the, the, uh, the cosmic powers, the spiritual forces of evil that we saw mentioned in our text today. Now, Many people, even Christians, shy away from a spiritual personality, the personification of evil called the devil. Especially in the United States and the modern Western world, we see ourselves as too scientific and sophisticated for that sort of belief. Interestingly, many of those who balk at the idea of a personal devil also rebel at the place of judge at a place of judgment called hell where the devil and all those who follow him in rebellion against God will spend eternity and so we pretend that if we just stop believing the devil is real that somehow he just ceases to exist maybe maybe if we stop believing is real all of his demons will just pack up and move to Indonesia or Haiti or Africa or somewhere where Witch doctors and superstition give them some street cred. You know, on one level, the, the events of 9-11 taught the Western world that pretending that the terror groups didn't exist didn't make the enemy go away, did it? And the same is true for our spiritual enemy. Don't be foolish, Paul says. In the unseen world, powerful spiritual forces are arrayed against you. Ignoring their existence doesn't change that reality or make them go away. Nor does shifting the battle to more familiar turf. You see, we prefer to fight against the spouse who ignores us or the boss who mistreats us or the child who disobeys us. We go to war against other people seeing them as the enemy. But for those who can or who will see into the unseen, Paul reminds us, your fight isn't against flesh and blood. Brothers and sisters, your unloving spouse isn't the enemy. Your ignorant roommate isn't the enemy. Your gangbanger neighbor isn't the enemy. All alike are victims of our common enemy. No wonder Jesus could say to us, love your human enemies, love your enemies, and pray for those who persecute you. 
Our fight isn't against flesh and blood. Listen, this truth alone should be freeing to many of us who pour our energies into the wrong fight against other people. But the Bible reminds us your fight isn't against flesh and blood. And also know this, that our real enemy, the enemy of our souls, doesn't fight fair. He never signed on to the Geneva Convention. Jesus said this is what he does, John 10.10. 10. He steals, he kills, and he destroys. He steals, he kills, and he destroys. Church, how many marriages have to be destroyed, Christian marriages, before we wake up to the schemes of the devil? Hog knows is a tempter and a liar. That new woman is going to fulfill your every need and fantasy. You married way too young. You didn't even know what love is. You deserve better. Just have to accept it. He'll never change. Where do we think that stuff comes from? The enemy of your souls is a liar. And nothing pleases him more than to see his lies destroy your hopes and your dreams and your relationships and your kids. And speaking of children, how many unborn children have to be killed? How many young people in our cities have to be murdered before we wake up to the fact that we're contending against spiritual rulers and forces of evil? Church, how many people, how many billions of people have to be locked away in systems of religious darkness with all hope of hearing the good news of Jesus Christ all but stolen from them before we realize that demonic powers rule over this present darkness? Only then will we as a church begin to pray accordingly. When we see into the unseen, we realize our spiritual adversary is a deceitful schemer. He doesn't fight fair. He'll throw temptation before your flesh. He'll squeeze you into the mold of the world and its unjust systems. He'll disguise himself as an angel of light, twist the truth, blind you to the consequences of sin, entice you with the trinkets of earth, fill your mind with fears. At times, he'll even deceive those closest to you to act as his unwitting agents. So how do we guard? How can, how can we, how can you possibly guard your soul against this powerful, deceitful, and determined enemy? Well, thanks be to God. When we see into the unseen, we realize that not only do we have in the heavenly places a powerful enemy, but we also have an immensely more powerful ally. It was the English writer William Hensley who coined the famous line, I'm the master of my fate, the captain of my soul. Of course, with spiritual eyes, we recognize that that is nonsense. But, but with grateful hearts, we as believers give Thanks for the real captain of our souls. The one who Paul said earlier in Ephesians is far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. Above every name that is named. Ephesians 1.21. Our captain isn't the accuser. He's the one who strips from the accuser all grounds of accusation against us. Thanks to his triumph on the cross. Our captain's name is Jesus. A name that's above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Now, I want to be clear. In many places, the scriptures talk about the church taking the offensive in the battle against the devil. For example, in 1 John 3, 8, we read that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. That's the language of offense. That's taking the battle to the enemy. But our text here in Ephesians today is different. It's personal. 
And here Paul is talking about defense, about guarding your soul in the fight, which Paul describes as wrestling. Now wrestling, that's not like sending an unmanned drone over to shoot the enemy, is it? Wrestling is hand-to-hand combat with demonic powers. And in this wrestling, the goal is that we would stand against the schemes of the devil. That we'd stand against his schemes and strategies. And that word stand is a military term. It means to resist the enemy, to hold your ground, to never surrender. You see, that's defense. It's guarding the ground of your soul and never surrendering that ground. In a football game, a goal line defensive stand is often a game changer. So it is when the enemy of your soul attacks and you stand. Hold your ground, not giving an inch. How do you do that? Well, Paul points us to two things. He says this, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Now, literally, that's an ongoing thing. Literally, it it reads, be continually strengthened in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Brothers and sisters, we can't just buck up and be strong on our own and expect to hold the ground of our soul. The strengthening we need is a continuing process, an ongoing process. That's first and foremost. And second, it's a strengthening that only happens in the Lord. Only as we tap into Jesus and his strength as our power source will we be equipped to stand, to hold the ground of our soul. Now, when I hear that, I'm drawn back to John chapter 15 to know how to do this. Jesus said this. He said, abide in me. I'm the vine. You are the branches. You know this. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Abiding in Jesus is the only source of strength for this fight. We need to be strengthened continually in the Lord, abiding in Him. Do you love Him with your whole heart tonight, church? Do you daily feed and strengthen your soul in His Word? Do you practice being in His presence continually throughout your day in every situation and in every human encounter? How do you hold the ground of your soul in the midst of the spiritual battles? Paul says the second key is to continually dress yourself in the whole armor of God. Now, we'll have much more to say about the armor of God when we return again in several weeks to our study of Ephesians. For now, let's just take note of this. It's God's armor, not yours. This isn't a cheap imitation This is the good stuff. It's his armor. His armor is fully capable of stopping every arrow, every dart that the enemy, with every IED that the enemy puts in your way. And he provides you with the whole armor, the whole package, a complete set of equipment, head to toe battle gear. God doesn't send you into the unseen spiritual battlefield without everything you need to stand the ground of your soul. Finally, I'd like to say tonight, remind us of a quote by a commentator named Stephen Travis. He says this, In the New Testament, it's not believers who tremble at the power of Satan, but demons who tremble at the power of God. Church, we need not fear our spiritual adversary, nor should we be caught unsuspecting. A battle rages in the heavenly places for your soul. Sticking your head in the sand doesn't change that truth. And you can't win this fight in your own strength. Only in the strength of his might 
and in the armor he provides, will your soul be equipped to stand against the schemes of the devil? And as the kids sang for us earlier, and if our God is for us, and if our God is for us, who can stand against us? Amen? Amen. 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 Would you bow your heads with me? Father, help us to leave this place and see into the unseen. To know that our adversary, the accuser, the devil, wages war on our soul. But we don't need to fear him. We don't need to tremble before him. Lord, that you stand ready to strengthen us in the strength of your might. Lord, to equip us in the whole armor of God. We don't need to fear him, Lord. We can stand the ground of our soul. Help us to do so as we leave this place. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.